In my view, uh, over the last four years, the biggest advancers in cancer treatment have really come in the arena of immunotherapy, and specifically understanding how to use these antibodies uh, to unleash the immune system, to allow it to attack cancer as it was innately programmed to do. Uh, we've seen uh, the development of these antibodies that are now being used in a broad spectrum of cancers that were not typically thought to be cancers that would be responsive to immunotherapy. Um, as you look at the field, in terms of the different general categories, and this is not a comprehensive list, one of the things that you'll find missing here is chemotherapy. Um, I think that we understand chemotherapy chemicals that are either naturally occurring products or those that are synthesized in the laboratory have an important role in cancer treatment. Uh, but the, field, uh, the, the fields of research that are really being focused on these days really are being more directed towards what's called molecular targets. And I think all of you were exposed to research that's involving molecular targets, but these are treatments that are directed to specific um, proteins or other aspects of a cancer cell that is much more uh, specific and directed than chemotherapy with the hope that you get an increased effectiveness and a much more favorable toxicity profile. Uh, and the other area is that's been very, very um, promising is immunotherapy. So in the grants that we reviewed this past year, we had proposals that really crossed the spectrum. Uh, but it's interesting that the Scientific Advisory Board, and you keep in mind that each one of these proposals is graded entirely independently and then scored, and then the scores are all put together and you just see what drops out, that you'll see as I talk about these proposals that there was a clear uh, focus uh, in molecular targets and in immunotherapy, which I think is appropriate because these are the areas where I think the field is holding greatest promise uh, currently. There were 50 proposals. We uh, uh, recommended 10 to the board and five have been funded. Um, the first one that I'll describe is one that is from Dr. Krug's institution. Uh, the PI was Dr. Uh, Tao Dao. And uh, the title of this uh, proposal was Specific Immunotherapy for Mesothelioma by Use of a Bispecific TCR-like Antibody. Very fancy title, but what basically it says is that um, there is a, uh, an antibody that's directed towards a specific protein that is present in mesothelioma cells uh, that may then induce an immune response to attack the cancer. Um, there was a lot, of, a lot of basic science that told us that this held great promise, uh, and so uh, this was a very highly scored uh, research proposal and has, has received funding uh, for, the next, for the next two years. The, um, the next study uh, was from the University of Texas, Dr. Usha Penderthi. Uh, we thought this was a very interesting study, and I'm going to actually just um, review the excerpts of this uh, so that I get the, the gist of this correctly. Now, this, um, this comes under the concept that I brought up earlier about tumor suppressor genes. Um, there are preliminary studies that Dr. Penderthi had done that showed that a specific protein that's present in normal tissues is gone in mesothelioma, just not there. So the hypothesis is that this protein may actually be one of those proteins that applies the brakes, that slows the growth of the cell down. And so the proposal was to engineer cancer cells to restore the function of this protein and see if it transformed them from a more cancerous to a more normal type state. Um, I think that this is a very innovative uh, project. Uh, the protein is called EPCR. It's actually an interesting protein because it's uh, one that's associated with vascular tissue, but it is one that is seen in, uh, in normal mesothelioma cells, but not in the cancer. And so this, we thought, was innovative. It takes a leap of faith, uh, but if it pays, uh, if, it, if it actually turns out to be true, then it could pay great dividends in terms of opening up new opportunities for, for treatment of patients with meso. The third study was one um, from the VU University Medical Center. 
uh, by Dr. Elisa Giovanetti. Um, Dr. Giovanetti's, um, uh, Dr. Giovanetti's um, research uh, is really looking at an interesting uh, phenomenon that has been um, appreciated to exist in cancerous tissues for, genera for years, decades. Turns out that cancers are adaptable, uh, that they uh, land in some neighborhood or they start growing some tissue and they learn to adapt to accommodate to any of the um, challenges within the environment that they need to uh, adapt to so that they continue to grow and thrive. Uh, that relates to generating blood vessels, uh, to adapting the uh, actual cells so that it can be more tolerant to some of the uh, conditions within the tissues, particularly acidosis. It turns out that cancerous tissues uh, tend to build up acid uh, lactate within them, and uh, that would normally be very toxic to normal tissues, but cancer cells tend to be very adaptable and will develop mechanisms to uh, be able to thrive in somewhat acidic environments. So Dr. Giovanetti's uh, work is really designed to try and thwart this adaptive mechanism uh, to see if that can uh, perhaps sensitize the cell uh, to other interventions uh, or even to promote a programmed kind of a cell death phenomenon uh, if they were not able to survive in a somewhat hostile environment. Again, very innovative. Uh, this is not something that we are, that's being explored in other cancer types, but if this turns out to be a, um, a valid observation and hypothesis, then this would obviously have great dividend uh, for, um, for future uh, therapeutics. Uh, the other one is um, uh, a study by uh, Dr. Mark DePereau. Many of you remember he was speaking here yesterday, the thoracic surgeon from Toronto. Uh, this was a clinically oriented study, so it moved away from basic science and immunotherapy. Uh, what, no, it does include some immunotherapy, which I think is very interesting. So Dr. DePereau's um, approach, as all of you know, is to use a kind of a novel package of radiation and surgery to treat pleural mesothelioma using very sophisticated uh, uh, imaging, uh, looking at giving high doses of radiation for a short period of time, uh, and then proceeding on to surgery. Uh, it's been known in the literature that radiation uh, to cancerous tissues uh, can actually uh, cause an unintended but potentially beneficial effect in the body. Uh, when you radiate cancerous tissues, they will tend to die, and as those cells die, they release their proteins into the um, tissues around them, and those proteins can be recognized by the immune system as foreign proteins. And so there is an activation of the immune system uh, that can occur as a result of radiating uh, tissue in one specific area of the body. And Dr. Perot's hypothesis is that if we were to unleash that immune activation, that we could see uh, immunologic activity against cancer even outside of the field of the radiation. This is called the abscopal effect, and it's gained a lot of traction in, uh, in cancer research uh, over the last five or so years, and I think that it's a very, very innovative, and I think it's supported by a lot of basic science work uh, that would indicate that you, know, you radiate a specific area of the body but you could potentially get benefit in other areas outside of, uh, of that in one area by the activation of the immune system. And you could even envision, could envision a scenario where just a portion of a tumor bed was radiated specifically for the purpose of providing the immune system with uh, a recognition profile of proteins that it could then be uh, activated to attack in other areas of the body. So, uh, as we all know, Dr. DePro has got a very active program, uh, and we think that this is going to be a very fruitful and, and, and potentially uh, promising area of research. The, um, the last of the five studies, again, has a, a kind of a blend of, of biomarker as well as immune, uh, immune flavor to it. This is a, a, an award given to Dr. Christian Ottensmeyer uh, from the University of Southampton. So this is a, a, a um, uh, award given to uh, an international researcher, uh, research group. And what they're looking at 
is whether or not the innate immune system, uh, if we study its kind of its, its activation profile in terms of whether or not it's suppressed or activated, um, may actually be associated with how a tumor behaves in an individual's body. Um, this is going to be very fundamentally important to understand because as we move forward with immunotherapies, we have to understand the uh, the, the immune system uh, and what states under which it's active or suppressed. And so Dr. Ottensmeyer and his group will be looking at uh, biomarkers, that is um, immunologically related biomarkers uh, that are potentially upregulated or downregulated in, uh, in patients with mesothelioma uh, to see if we can understand the uh, kind of the, the state of the immune system uh, during various phases of treatment in people with mesothelioma. And by understanding that, uh, we would then be able to more intelligently select therapies uh, that would uh, uh, perhaps take advantage of an immune system that was poised and ready uh, to be effective, um, uh, as opposed to trying that in somebody whose immune system was clearly not quite ready uh, to be activated. So we have five protocols that, uh, or five proposals that have been approved. Uh, one is a clinically oriented one, Dr. Deep Rose. We have one that is looking at a tumor suppressor phenomenon. We have one that's looking at a specific antibody in mesothelioma. Uh, we have one that's looking at attacking the adaptive ability of cancer cells uh, to live in hostile environments. And then we have one that's looking at the immune system status in tumors uh, or in patients uh, with mesothelioma to see where we can potentially capitalize on using the immune system to uh, help attack this tumor. I think all of these have great promise. Uh, I think this is, uh, I think this is money that's well invested uh, and uh, um, that uh, we will uh, expect to see some promising results from these investigators at future uh, MARF meetings in the future. Um, I think that's basically uh, what we wanted to present this morning. The, um, the only other one or two minute uh, uh, point that I would make is that yesterday uh, as part of the scientific uh, sessions, the uh, group of researchers and clinicians that are focused on peritoneal mesothelioma also met in separate session. Uh, and I think we had some very, very uh, good discussions about uh, the state of the science, uh, the, the, um, uh, the need that we have uh, to really work more collaboratively. Uh, and, uh, and, and try to combine forces to make meaningful advances in, 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 in establishing evidence-based treatment standards for patients with peritoneal mesothelioma. You know, we've had an unintended kind of uh, development over the last five or six years in the country, which I think has, uh, provides us potential challenges, but maybe some even greater opportunities. The number of centers that are capable of providing a uh, surgical procedure, this cytoreduction procedure with the HIPEC, which is the chemotherapy perfusion, um, has increased, has almost, uh, has more than doubled, basically, in the last five or six years. And so there are now many more hospitals uh, that are providing a service uh, that could be used for patients with peritoneal mesothelioma, uh, but we don't know whether or not they have really the expertise uh, to understand the disease and understand the use of this uh, modality uh, and whether or not they have the comprehensive kind of integrated uh, approach of looking at, you know, other therapies that might be needed uh, in the management of this disease. And I think those individuals who are at these centers understand that and they want to contribute uh, to a kind of global kind of a, a collaborative type of an effort. So even though we have more centers doing them, which is perhaps diffusing the, uh, the population of mesothelioma patients to more hospitals than we've seen in the past, uh, I think this is also uh, highlighting a need for collaboration. If there are two hospitals that are each treating 50 patients, the collaboration is easy. You just have combined efforts between two hospitals. But if you've got 100 hospitals that are each treating two or three or four patients a year, the challenges are much greater. But the need to do so is obvious. And so my hope is that based on our uh, dialogue yesterday that we will be uh, making some recommendations to uh, the board uh, for um, uh, perhaps uh, some collaborative uh, proposals that MARF may support to ensure that all of these individuals are receiving the type of expert care that they need and that we're able to um, collaborate in terms of uh, understanding information and, uh, and developing innovative um, therapeutics. Um, 
I have a question here, which is a tough one. It says, what happens if the results of a seed grant are very positive, but the PI fails to get funding uh, to move forward? You know, it can happen. It can happen. Um, I think that um, as, these, as these proposals go forward, uh, we're going to be looking at their data and understanding you know, to what extent the uh, hypothesis is borne out to be true. I have to say that I do have some faith in the system that um, those studies that are really, uh, truly uh, innovative and promising that there will be opportunities for funding. Keep in mind that we're always looking for and expanding uh, the uh, different avenues for potential continued funding sources. We do have the DOD, we do have the NCI, uh, and there are other mechanisms uh, through other foundations that we might partner with. But this is a real risk. This is a real risk because there are no guarantees that a positive study in mesothelioma supported by the MARF is going to automatically be funded at the next level. Uh, so uh, we just have to wait and see, but it's, uh, it's gonna be our responsibility, I think, to try to prevail upon those organizations that can continue to build upon our early successes that this is money from their perspective that would be well spent. But it's a very good question. I don't have a perfect answer for it. Other questions? Yes. So the question is, how does an inert material like asbestos cause cancer? And I wish we had Dr. Carbone here because he is obviously the world's expert in this. Um, Lee, do you want to answer this? I can give you my, my kind of pedestrian perspective, but I, I think that it's not going to be as complete as it could be. These substances are actually not inert. That's the problem. And they are not biodegradable which is another problem. So once they are in the tissues of the body, uh, they tend to stay there uh, for the lifespan of that individual. And these small particles have features to them that unfortunately generate a initial inflammatory response. And we know that cancer in the broadest context is really a chronic inflammatory disease, that it is the consequence of inflammation uh, in tissues that causes damage to tissues that ultimately allows them to degenerate into a full-blown cancer. So what I believe is happening here is that these, these particles, these small mineral particles that are just the right size to induce an inflammation around them for years, a chronic inflammatory uh, state where there are immunologic cells that are trying to digest this thing and, and, and destroy it. Uh, there are some bystander and unattended effects that damage healthy normal tissues adjacent to these particles. And those mesothelial cells, after years of being subjected to inflammation and irritation, will become damaged and deranged and ultimately degenerate into cancer. So they're not inert. They're not inert. Is that a fair? Oh. So that's what happens. Another question? So the question is, uh, what about other drugs that are uh, potentially out there to be approved? Um, you know, traditionally, if you go back 20 years, the, uh, the field of cancer research when it came to chemotherapeutics was uh, basically called a field of spray and pray. And what would happen, literally, is that the NIH would have large banks of cancer cell lines that are different types that they would make available to researchers who would put them into petri dishes and just put on any kind of different compounds, and this was the spray and pray phenomenon, and then you'd see what worked and what didn't. Uh, a very kind of a nonspecific kind of a, a shotgun approach to identifying uh, new potential therapeutics. Um, that kind of has been replaced now by this field of molecular targets. And so I don't want you to get the impression that chemotherapeutics are not interesting, but I think that what we're really looking at now is complementing the chemotherapies that we have uh, with other types of modalities that will enhance their effectiveness. Pemetrexid, cisplatinum, gemcitabine, carboplatinum uh, are all used. Uh, gemcitabine can be used kind of off-label. Keep in mind that you know, a practicing physician uh, who's taking care of an individual patient is not under the regulation of the FDA. 
the practice of medicine is not regulated by the government. And so if there is an individual who a physician feels in his or her judgment may benefit from a chemotherapeutic for the mesothelioma, it can be used. Um, yeah, yeah, please, sorry, I'm, 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 maybe I'm going in the wrong direction on this. And so um, I, I don't know that we're going to, my own thought was that we're not going to see a lot of new chemotherapeutics, but we may see more targeted agents. Let me have Dr. Krug talk about this. I, just, I, I had one other thought about that uh, question. You know, um, for a new drug to get approved in the U.S., um, generally that drug has to show some level of efficacy in what we call a phase three trial. So that's a large randomized trial usually where you have to demonstrate that the new treatment improves survival over the old treatment. And these trials are challenging to do uh, because in a rare disease such as this, it can take many years to enroll all the patients. It usually requires an international effort and they're, they're very expensive. Uh, some, these phase three trials can range in the you know, millions of dollars to, to actually run. Um, that being said, there are actually several trials going on now that are these what we call registration trials in, in this disease. And if they, are, if they demonstrate efficacy, then these drugs will get approved. For example, that includes the tremolumumab trial that I mentioned, that, uh, that immunotherapy. Um, that is a large international trial. In fact, uh, so in, you know, the, these trials can be challenging for patients to participate in because unfortunately they compared the um, standard of care being placebo, which is you know, scientifically appropriate perhaps, um, but can be a challenge for a patient to participate in in that regard. But nonetheless, um, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's what they need to show the benefit against. And so um, this tremolumumab trial is going on. In fact, they, they've enrolled the first 180 patients on that study in the first nine months of the trial, very rapid accrual for a trial like this. And now they're expanding it to 540 patients. So that trial will take a few years to complete, but it's the kind of study where if it shows positive results, that trial was designed to get that drug approved in mesothelioma. There's another one that we've heard about during this meeting with the FAP inhibitor from Veristem. And that, that uh, trial is the one that's in the maintenance setting. So that's for patients who have finished initial chemotherapy and have had at least stabilization of their cancer or maybe some shrinkage. And then they're randomized to that, that drug, which is a pill, um, or placebo. And then they're monitored. And that is also a large registration trial. And so if that one also shows benefit, then that would lead to approval of that drug in this disease. And there are others. So that's why it, for us as, as clinicians and clinical researchers, this is an exciting time because there, it's been rare that we've had so many trials that are going on to, that have the potential of actually leading to drug approval in this disease. trying to hear that you're asking about the uh, um, matching grants for MARF to get supplemental funds from a, another organization or partner with another organization. Yeah. No. Yeah, no, I think it's a, I, listen, it's a very good idea, and it's something that perhaps we should be discussing uh, amongst the various boards. Uh, is, Mar is, Mary, is Mary in the room here? Oh, there you are, Mary. So, you know, just a matching grants as a you know, partnership with other organizations to try to leverage more buy-in. I think it's a very, very good idea. I think it's an excellent idea.
Well, in the, in the cases that I mentioned, we're not comparing the treatment against hematraxid cisplatin. Um, the the trimalumumab trial that's being run by Metamune is in patients who have had that chemotherapy and it's no longer effective. Um, and that can be given as a second treatment or as a third treatment in that study. And that trial is open for both peritoneal and pleural mesothelioma. Um, and then uh, the other trial is in the maintenance setting. So again, it's not competing against standard chemotherapy. It's in patients who have had standard chemotherapy already and are on that treatment break. And so it, it's a different setting. So they don't have to prove their um, another trial design that would be a potential one to explore for other drugs, for example, would be one where you give pemetrexed and cisplatin in, to one group of patients and pemetrexed plus cisplatin plus the new drug to another group of patients. So, and then you'd have to show that that drug improved the outcomes over that just the standard of care. So, so that would be how those types of trials would be designed. <coughs> Okay, thanks so much. <laughs>